Well, here we are back for another Snake Island treasure quest. Cup of coffee. So, kind of a dreary day today. It's like snowing and raining. That's like what I hate the most. But, let me ask you a question. Do you ever think about the treasure map? Because I always found it very entertaining that they had me take the map, put it up with the room, the, the, quote, the Bat Cave, where they had us in the clubhouse back in Ilia Bella, and they have me take the map and put it up on the wall. And this is the supposed treasure map as, as an overlay. And then they had me put it up, turn it over, spin it around, <laughs> And then it kind of looks like the island. Well, let me give you some backstory. Because here was a real treasure hunt that I wrote about in my first big book, my international bestseller, The Bamboo Chest. Now, let me show you that treasure map. You know, that's the Captain Kid treasure map right there. You see that? Nice and clear. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Now that was cat that treasure map was found in a uh, leg of a chair that supposedly belonged to Captain Kid and was part of his uh, estate when he was hung. Okay. Now that is a um, an aerial map from the war from the Vietnam War for the Air Force, okay? And uh, in this one, you can see the shape of that island right there. That island right there, that island is Onchelon. In French, it was called Ile des Pirates, or actually it was Grand pa uh, Pirate, uh, yeah, um, was it uh, uh, Ile des Pirates uh, Grand in, uh, in French? Because they already knew there were pirates in that area, and that's what led Richard Knight to go and look around in that part of the Thai Gulf. But when you look at the map of the of the the real treasure island, and you look at the real treasure map of that island, there's no spinning it around and turning it around and flipping it over in order to say, "Oh, that must be." Snake Island. <laughs> First of all, I'm kind of pissed off because they stole the idea from my book, which was a real event, and then they tried to create this fake event over at Discovery in order to fit Eileen O'Neill's dream of competing directly against History Channel's Mystery of Oak Island. Now, that's just wild because it's like it's being used as a documentary. It's histor supposed it's historical record. And this is where I get ticked off. So think about this. And that's why I wrote this book. Going back to the woodpile again. I wrote this book because I wanted to correct the historical record. The historical record is to confirm that it was a TV show that was fully scripted. You know, let's look at these things. Oh, see that one right there? The story about that? If you haven't got the book yet, yeah, that eye being ripped open, the eyelid, that was the uh, assault and battery by Jeremy Whalen when he got all coked up on cocaine. Yeah, that was the other stash that was brought by uh, his brother when they smuggled across the artifacts across from uh, Paraguay. That's where they came in from. But using the land route. And the reason is, is because Jeremy and his brother are very well acquainted in the drug smuggling routes of Latin America. So you should think about that one. And that one right there, is that real? Is that the one that Discovery is posting all over on Facebook and saying, oh my God, it's going to be worth how much? $250,000? Yeah, that was uh, created by our art director, uh, Sebastian Bale. Okay, and uh, that's also in this book too, explaining how he got hired, why he got hired. And it happened all the way back in Brazil because his wife is Brazilian, and they both work in the field of uh, creative arts in theater. They build all the props, and that's how they got hired to be on Treasure Quest. 
So let's see. What, what else is in this? Oh, oh my God. Wow, why is Tim Kennedy? Yeah, SF, sniper, operator, uh, major self-promoter. Kind of like pisses off a lot of guys that are my friends in the Green Beret community, in the SFA. In the SFA because of the antics he's up to. But why is he in this book? And why is this screen right here from Treasure Quest so pertinent to this screen right here? Because they're shot at the same location? Yeah, Hunting Hitler. This is, remember the envy? This is the penis envy between Discovery Channel and Discovery Communications and History Channel and A&E. Because A&E basically is the umbrella for, for uh, History Channel and all their, their line. And there's these battles back and forth. For you, the audience, who can they hoodwink into thinking you're following along on a real treasure hunt? See, it gets even better because when you look at this picture, then you get the idea of what's happening. Now, why is that person's hand circled in the photograph? If you download the Kindle, you'll see it immediately. It's a nice, bright orange ring telling you what he's doing. He's basically... Trying to remember a name that he was told to say, because it's also, Hunting Hitler is a scripted show too. Oh my God, how can you say that? Because I'm paying attention. And because I look behind the veil. Kind of like in The Wizard of Oz, when you look behind the curtain, you go, oh shoot, that's the wizard? Ah, uh, but Tweedledee and Tweedledum. That's a whole chapter on, on, uh, on Jeremy Whalen and his brother, and their old family history. And the whole idea of... Uh, how those goes, those guys like to play in the dark. And that's the thing about it. When you're dealing with criminals, the way you deal with criminals is you do the opposite of what they want to happen, which is they always succeed. Criminals succeed through keeping their actions secret. Okay? So when you bring their actions into the public eye and you light them up, as I like to say, as a lot of us like to say, then you start to see things. Such as, here's a picture of James Whalen. Yeah, that's the guy who's writing the one-star reviews. Yeah, I tracked him back. If you go over to my Bamboo Chest, go over to Bamboo Chest, the second edition review line, and you'll see there's actually some pretty good reviews I actually write about the book. But then you start looking at the other ones, and especially the one-star. The one-stars are created by James Whalen, who's supposedly a techie guy. Because uh, Jeremy was always saying, oh, yeah, my brother really... It's kind of funny. Why would you tell somebody like me when you're actually conducting a, a smear campaign against me on the internet and using your brother to do it because you think he's so technically smart. But what I kept secret from Jeremy and nobody really knew is that I worked as an executive in the software business during the gold rush in Silicon Valley. And one of the companies I worked for was a company called Secure Computing. In Secure Computing, it was a corporation whose customers were the NSA, the CIA, uh, who else? Oh, yeah, Wells Fargo, and a variety of other companies that their business is making sure guys like this can't break into your computers and onto your, your, your servers, and we can track you back. So Jer James Whalen, a.k.a. Kendall McKibben, because in that is wild to, re to, to understand why he had to change his name because of what happened and documentation of that and what their father did. That's all in here. When you read it, it kind of like turned, it turned my stomach when I read about it. It explains why Jeremy and his brother are the way they are, but uh, it doesn't forgive what they did and what they do. So when you play that kind of game, you start to open up a whole legal barrage of things happening. And it's no wonder that Jeremy once told me, he says, the reason I don't live in the States is I get in trouble. Well, he doesn't have to live in the States to get in trouble. So think about what I just told you. And perhaps you might want to get a copy of this book because this book kind of explains this book. If you know the backstory of how I got hired onto Treasure Quest Snake Island, and then to explain how and why I wrote this book. So, just a little bit of history about treasure maps. And when you try to make assumptions and try to get it across that this is how the island was found, 
supposedly by me. I never even knew about the treasure. I this 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 uh, was it uh, Tesoro de Sombrio, the mysterious treasure. I did not know about it until I was hired. I was hired as an actor. That's the thing about it. That's what I keep on telling everybody is that they discovery does not go out and and get people to come to them with documentaries. They go to Hollywood because it's a sure thing. If you're in control of the script, if you're in control of the story, and you intimidate your personnel through NDAs and try to keep them secret until people wake up and go, wait a minute, you're having me keep quiet under an NDA about criminal activity? Like drug smuggling and what's the other one? Oh, artifact smuggling? Those are international crimes. But Discovery thinks, hey, you know, if nobody says anything, we're peachy. And when they're making that amount of money. Yeah, so some of you have commented about, like, are you watching your six? Yeah, I watch my six all the time. And I train all the time now. Like I used to. It's kind of wild I'm having to do this again at this time in my life. I mean, I'm, I just turned 54, by the way. So I'd have to... Train the way I did back in my 20s when I was fighting a war, just so that I'm ready for what possibly could happen, because there is so much money involved. We're talking millions. David Zaslav, was it last year, made $42 million? And the year before, no, 2012, as I recall, he made, including stocks, $157 million. When you have that amount of money potentially being lost, and all the other revenue that keeps on coming, and it's because of how they're playing the game. Not because they're playing the game honorably. Not because they're actually doing documentary. Because remember, who, who, is, who is the poster boy for this type of documentary? Michael Moore. A person who I absolutely revile. Long before anybody freaking started seeing him as a TV producer and a film producer. No, because he was the editor of Mother Jones. Where he was famously known. This is while I was in the war, by the way. And we were fighting the San Anises, And we were fighting the FMLN. Because they were basically just the, the muchachos for Fidel Castro and Raul Castro. That's why it's kind of like people say, what do you think about Raul Castro? Now he's in power. I said, man, he was the one who was running the operations back then. Fidel was just a politician. <laughs> Fidel was nothing. Raul was the one who was the spiritual soulmate of Che Guevara. And those guys were all about spreading the word of communism throughout Latin America. And by doing so, creating the situations they had in Nicaragua at that time, to the point that the atrocities that were being committed by the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, Michael Moore did not give a damn about them, and it was, is famously quoted as not caring about the um, atrocities being committed by the Sandinistas as long as the Sandinistas remain in power. That's Michael Moore. That's the same Michael Moore who created this industry. Basically, whether he knows it or not, he created this industry through copycats who said, wow, man, I can either be an honest documentarian, which means you're really, I mean, it's almost like the priesthood. Because if you talk to real documentarians, they're always trying to get money to make this film, always trying to make money, get money to do this and do that. But they turn out solid work. Then you got people over discovery and history, which is like, hey, let's just make up a story and we'll just fit these people in. And how do you get these people in? That's maybe something I'll talk about later. What is the benefit? Because remember, every humans, I love psychology. I mean, from my background, you got to study psychology because you understand the hows and whys. If you've ever worked in marketing, if you've ever worked in the intelligence field, you study the psychology of people. Because if you're tracking in the, in the days when we were going after bad, bad people back in Central America, you first learn their psychology. Quote, profiling. You profile their psychology. You profile where they come from. You profile the way they think. You profile all these things and you put it in. And then you have a dossier. And once you have this dossier, you basically have a checklist. And you use this checklist to set up an operation if you do it right. Well, when you look at how things have come about in the reality TV industry, First, they thought, oh, we'll just put a camera, you know, on a wall and just have these people together. And let's see what happens. And we'll just garner what we can out of it. Okay. 
that's a lot of work. You know, it was a Big Brother. I think it was like the one that's famously known as the first like reality TV show where you just have a fly on the wall. I actually have no problem with that. It looks like crap, but hey, people are into that. That's fine. It's when you start scripting the things and you start making it look like it's real. And this is the thing about Treasure Quest. And this is the thing about Curse of Oak Island. This is the thing about hunting Hitler. There's some solid information in there. But the problem with it is when you start scripting and it's no longer, well, you know, in our opinion, this is the way it is. And then you go and look and investigate and say, no, instead what you say, in our opinion, you talk amongst your board, you know, your board of directors, your, 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 produ your production table. And you say, hmm, what can we have our characters do next? Let's make it interesting. Now, what kind of historical facts can we throw in there to make it look like it's interesting? When you start doing that, and then somebody watches it, and I can't tell you how many people, it, it just, it is sad that I have to, re, to, now I'm actually responding, before I didn't, because that contract is very intimidating until you actually read it and start to look further into it. And I hope other people who have been in the re reality, I mean, you already seen like Cody Lundin, he's got a defamation case against Discovery Channel. Uh, Michael Hawk has had, has had a, uh, a case against Discovery for, for years, but they're always really good at getting out of it because they have a lot of lawyers. I had one magazine, a military-oriented magazine, the producer, I mean the, uh, the publisher and editor of that magazine, wrote to me and said, Court, I know your story. I want it. Write me a piece. Write me about your book. You know, basically, he wanted me to write a plug for this book, so he would publish it in his magazine. His lawyers came back and said, you will never publish that article. You will never publish that, that plug for that book. Not now, not ever. The reason is, the lawyer says, Discovery is notorious for litigation. They will sue everybody. So basically, David Zasloff is like this, he's like this Genghis Khan out there freaking trying to take it off. So there you got little old me. And all I can do is write a book and get it out to as many people as I can. And hopefully you'll help me by getting out to as many people you know and have them read the book. And then maybe we might actually instigate some change. And I think that'd be one of the best things for media and information. Because if you've got kids and you really want them to know what history is and what it is about, because it's really important. I mean, our country is based on history. Our world is based on history. We make our decisions based on history. There's an old thing after, after the concentration camps. They say, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Well... It's not only that, it's those who never even got it are doomed to experience the most nightmarish hell because they weren't even prepared or knowledgeable about what was coming. And that's what happens when you have a media. And this, this, this is totally new. This is where a media could actually put us in one of the most dangerous pickles you could ever imagine in this world. So, get a copy of my book. Please... Like and share my comments here. And also, a four to five uh, star uh, review if you really like the book over at uh, Amazon would be much appreciated because, like I say, I am dealing with Jeremy and his brother getting accounts and typing up their nice little uh, one star reviews so that they can try and uh, dissuade people from buying the book and finding out the truth about they, their family, the whole freaking twisted thing, the whole thing about how to... They're, it's amazing. Discovery, actually, it, it's, it's almost like the reality TV industry, and I wrote about this, is that it's, it's almost like people who get on the show think they can rewrite their family history instead of correcting their family history. Remember, I worked for eight years as a counselor, specialization in PTSD for the Native American Community Center, uh, Native American uh, Health Center, <clears throat> Friendship House Association of American Indians in San Francisco. <laughs> you change your world by... Fixing and healing your own personal family history. You make peace with it and you heal on it and then you go forward. You don't try to rewrite it. If you rewrite it, what happens is the truth comes out and it comes and gets you and bites you in the ass. And that's what my book's about. So, I hope you get a copy of So You Want to Be a Reality TV Star. And if you want to get the even, not better, but pretty damn good back history... Pick up a copy of the uh, second edition of The Bamboo Chest. This is 
all about when I got thrown in prison back in 83 and got out in 84 and all the stuff that happened since. So on that note, I will sign off and I will see you maybe tomorrow. Have a good evening.